Thank you again for joining us. We are sure that this will be a very informative program. It is my honor to call upon Dr. Gross. So, of course, I have to say uh, two things. First, uh, very recent development in my career. I'm also now the chief medical officer at a company called Natera. So I just want to just uh, let people know they do, in fact, do genetic testing, although not breast and ovarian cancer. Um, but more importantly, just to say thank you, really from the bottom of my heart, for welcoming me here today. Uh, I think there is a historical context. We've done a lot of work on autosomal recessive disorders, commonly known as Jewish genetic diseases, Tay-Sachs, familial dysautonomia, uh, Gaucher, and the like. And there are similarities and differences, but the major similarity is that it should be noted, and it is important to say again and again, the reason that as a medical geneticist, I actually have not seen a child with Tay-Sachs is because 30 years ago when I was a teenager, the Jewish community decided that we have the knowledge, the power, the intelligence, and the compassion to take care of a problem within our community. It was the sisterhoods that partnered um, with the medical uh, leadership at the time to make sure that there would be no more children affected with these disorders. And that since that time, we're talking about thousands and thousands of healthy Jewish children. And again, to tell you what it means to be here today, breast cancer is not new. It's been around for a very long time. A lot of our knowledge is new, and I'll be presenting that to you today. But what has changed, and this is really the take home message, this is not a talk on the genetics of breast cancer. It really isn't. I'm gonna to explain to you all of it. You'll know as much, I promise you, as my medical students and genetic counselors and my fellows by the time we're done. It's really, I love genetics. The beauty in it is its, its simplicity, but I'm here today because there is so much that we can do to prevent breast cancer, aside from manage, but to actually prevent. And we have, again, it's about generations. We have, please God, for, you know, certainly the rest of my lifetime, but even after we are not here anymore, we're going to have generations and generations of Jewish children we do need to care about. And that's why I'm here. That's our responsibility today. Um, I'm also really here on behalf of the program for Jewish genetic health, so I'm not even speaking personally. Um, I was the founding director of this program. It's now been taken over by fantastic staff, um, really from top to bottom in terms of medical leadership and the best genetic counselors I've ever had the privilege of working with. Um, in your folders, the people are actually in the room, um, there is the contact information. It is a joint program with Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Yeshiva University. Um, the phone number for those uh, who are online, 718-430-4156. And the email is jewishgenetichealth at yu.edu. The web is www.yu.edu slash genetichealth. Even I still just Google this. Put in Einstein program Jewish genetic health. It'll come up. And again, please note um, that name was not an accident. It is not Jewish genetic disease. It is Jewish genetic health. The program deals with everything that may interact with being Jewish and genetic. Um, I have had the privilege of working with Rabbi Willig and, and other several, um, really Gdolei Hador on questions that come up. Uh, but very often, uh, the people I'm speaking to today, the women I'm speaking to today, first know about these issues. Rebetzins, Yetzir Halacha, all of the people in color classes, all of what you do, I can't even begin to tell you how important it is. I'm speaking to you today as a Jewish woman, about Jewish women, for Jewish women. And again, there are actually men in the room who are helping us organize the program today. There may be men listening in, but I think all of you can understand that there's a certain sensitivity that really only comes about when, again, coming full circle, we look at this as a sisterhood. And that's going to be, uh, that's about it for my introduction. And now let's get into um, to the program. Again, for those of you who can get on the web, we have posted educational programs. We even have one about breast and ovarian that might answer a lot of the questions you still have today. 
uh, you know, there's a lot of medical detail and, and uh, you know, other such finer points. Not my highlight of the program today. Today it's really to empower you to really save lives. So again, very quick slide about cancer. Uh, the way to understand cancer is we do call it a genetic disease, and you hear it a lot, so I just want to explain it so we don't get confused. Uh, cells are dividing all the time. Cells make mistakes, and 99 plus percent of the time, really the miracle of human body and biology is we correct the mistakes as our cells divide. From time to time, that correction does not occur. And if you have a buildup of certain changes in the DNA, then you end up with cells that don't know to stop growing and don't know where they should be. So that's why, for example, if you have certain cancers, they spread. Cells should know, for example, breast cells. They belong in the breast. But when some of these changes happen, they spread where they shouldn't be. Likewise, cells in our bodies know, need to know when to stop growing. Same problem. These changes make certain effects that the cells just don't stop. And that, in fact, is what cancer is. Now, typically it's common in older populations. The reason is what I just explained. Over the course of a lifetime, statistically, more and more changes can happen in the DNA. That's why it's a function of older people. Um, that, that number is true, one in two men to one in three women. Again, there are um, cancers such as skin cancer is very common, very easily treatable, uh, that will come just over time and certain exposures. Uh, but that number is actually real. The number that scares all of us, the one in eight risk of breast cancer, but that number is over the course of a lifetime. If you make it out to be 80 years old, you do have a more than 10% chance that that may happen. Ovarian cancer is really much rarer. Even if you live a very long, full life, it's unusual to have uh, ovarian cancer. It's not as common as breast cancer. As a doctor and as a woman, it's a little scarier because we don't have very good screening tests for it. And that's why if any of you do know uh, a woman who's had ovarian cancer, breast cancer we tend to pick up earlier. You can feel um, lumps, you go for mammograms. Ovarian cancer, we don't have programs like that. So often by the time it's picked up, it's a little later. Uh, so it's less rare, but unfortunately more concerning. And the last bullet, most cancers are not hereditary. You can't pass on cancers by and large. What I describe is the usual case. Over the course of time, you build up these changes, and that's the common cancer. What I'm gonna to speak to you today, however, is this idea of hereditary cancers, of being able to pass along certain mutations that predispose to cancer. Risk factors for cancer in general. Again, age, now everybody uh, listening in and at the tables here understand why age would be an issue. Family history does play a role. There's certain predisposition in our backgrounds that can um, cause issues. Medical history, uh, you know, certain background history, for example, if you've had radiation therapy for one problem, it can cause issues elsewhere. Hormones, hormones, hormones. Honestly, you'd have to be living under a rock not to have been reading in the paper and following the story with uh, hormone replacement therapies and the issues there. Um, other things though actually are good if you have your children, um, depending when you have your children, having more children, breastfeeding, those all uh, actually might be preventative. So there's uh, good news in hormones as well. Birth control pills are very effective in protecting against especially ovarian cancer. A lot of people don't know that, but that is in fact uh, the case. And women use contraceptives and birth control pills for other things besides birth control. Um, we prescribe it sometimes just to regulate uh, people's uh, menses, so that's important too. Physical activity, uh, I'll let you guess, is physical activity a good thing? Okay, absolutely. You know, when all is said and done, we have all kinds of replacement therapies and all sorts of things, but please take a walk every day. Try to park the car a little bit further, you know, from your house or where you work if you can or when you go shopping. I can't emphasize enough, and really, truly, this is not running the New York Marathon. Keep yourself healthy. Uh, it really, really matters in every way. Alcohol, we can try that one. You think drinking a lot is good or bad? It's the same thing. Um, it's, a very, it's a very nice thing because, again, in our world, we do have alcohol. Uh, but one of the important things, of course, again, is that for us, it's all about you know, moderation. So absolutely, um, you know, kiddish, 
Shabbos, fantastic. That's not the problem. Uh, again, in moderation and in the right uh, place and time. And dietary fat goes back and forth. Um, again, for the purpose of today's talk, uh, Rambam got it right. I tell my students this all the time. Shvil Azahav. Moderation in all things really seems to be the most sensible path, even when we're talking about a uh, good and healthy diet. Now, again, I'm going to show some slides about why there's been such concern in the community. And concern almost to the point of paralysis, because people look at this and, you know, it's like, what do I do? So let me show you the problems, and then we're going to segue into really what I consider now incredible uh, accomplishments and achievements that we can actually take control of this. So if you look behind me on the slide, on the um, left-hand side it says relative risk of breast cancer. I'm going to show, share with you some numbers later, but that's not really the issue. It's much more the relative risk, the idea of what really bumps up uh, your risk for having breast ovarian cancer. And you can see the short, stubby little bars. Those are the things we kind of spoke about. Um, you know, getting your period early actually is a risk factor. Late age of birth of first child, you know, can be an issue. Hormone replacement therapy, alcohol use. But they are only going to increase your risk just a little bit. And in fact, look at this. There's family history. Even if you have, you know, a grandmother, you look at the family history, maybe one grandmother, age of 70, she developed breast cancer. Um, it bumps up your risk, but a little bit. What we're going to talk about today is this. If you have the breast and ovarian cancer, BRCA uh, mutation in that gene, the BRCA genes, that's what, again, has almost paralyzed our community. The relative risk, if you have a mutation in either BRCA1 or BRCA2, that really bumps up your risk considerably. And again, I'll give you the numbers, but please, you can go home and forget about those. It's not nearly as important as just the concept of what the issue is here. So here are the numbers. You know, basically, it tells you over the course of a lifetime for breast cancer, you're going, your risk for breast cancer increases. Again, for the reasons I told you, you have more exposures to chemicals and who else knows what's out there. And again, your cells are always dividing. Please take a look. You see population risk on, the, on this line there, and then you see hereditary risk. The difference is very obvious, okay? And I'll explain to you uh, why shortly. But the hereditary risk really is substantial over the baseline risk. Take home message from this slide also, by the way, is everybody has a risk for breast cancer. So even if you don't carry these mutations, please still you know, do the right thing, not only for yourselves, but all the other women you know, that you spend time with and work with in your personal professional lives to get you know, mammograms and proper screening. But you can see over the course of a lifetime, if you have a mutation, the risk of breast cancer really goes up very significantly. You know, we're talking the 50s to 80%. And again, Take a look at what's happening here by age of 50. A third to half of women, if you carry this mutation, you may end up with a breast cancer. That's the other thing I think that really activated us. And again, thank you, OU, for taking this on. We are seeing this in younger women. Okay, that's, I think, part of what's prompting a lot of the concern. These are women you know, who have young families. These are women who are mothers, daughters, children, um, so I think that this particular facet is one of the reasons that there's been so much concern, the early onset. Uh, ovarian cancer, again, if you carry one of these mutations, ovarian cancer risk goes up as well, uh, much higher than the general population. Because remember I told you it's about, you know, one in 70 or, you know, one in 100. It's not common over the course of a lifetime. But if you carry one, a mutation, one of the BRCA genes, that goes up as well. And again, thank goodness we have ways of preventing this. So let's go back and let's understand some of the basic genetics and the science behind this, and a lot of this will make uh, more sense to you as to what is going on. So first of all, uh, this is a wonderful slide. Uh, it's part of the Human Genome Project, um, which I'll show you in a moment, but the Human Genome Project basically is that we've sequenced all of human <coughs> DNA. There's three billion letters. The letters represent certain molecules, what we call base pairs, but three billion letters. And a few years ago, we were able to finish that project. We can read all the letters. Our 
uh, DNA, because it's so long, in fact, if you stretched it out in every cell, it's really meters long. So that's why they're packaged in chromosomes. Otherwise, the cells would always fail. And the way I explain it to uh, my patients is it's like pearl necklaces. If you keep your pearl necklaces, you know, nice and organized, uh, you can find them right away. You know, they're easy to pull, to grab, to put on, especially when, you know, you didn't leave enough time to get ready. If you just throw everything into your jewelry box, it's much harder to deal with the pearl necklaces. So if you think about it, the necklace is what I call the, that's the chromosome to me. That's the basic packaging. The pearls are like the genes. Humans have 46 necklaces. They come in pairs. We got one necklace from our father, one necklace from our mother, and that's how we get 23 pairs. And the pearls, those are really the genes. And the, the way this works is you have that beautiful double helix, which is the DNA symbol everybody sees. There's other molecules that are able to read the letters, and those letters translate into proteins. The proteins get put together, and that's how um, our bodies work. And again, it, it is such a beautiful thing because it's actually not very complicated. There's real simplicity to the system. This is a sequence uh, that is actually available on the web. You can go look this up anytime. It's all public available now and what you see is a string of letters and one of the reasons I love giving these talks to people from our community is that we're the people who know of books where you see lots of letters and no punctuation so the light bulb usually goes off very quickly every time you open up a Gemara what is real learning it's trying to actually a good part of the time figure out where the punctuation is and how to break the letters and words up into uh, what makes sense. It's exactly the same. We finish the code, but all the science you read about in the papers every day, we're still trying to understand the code. Where to put in the punctuation? What parts of the letters are actually translating into proteins? That is molecular biology the world over. And the concept is exactly the same. This actually is a piece of the Tay-Sachs gene. But you can pull up any gene you want. So what is the idea here? I keep saying if you're a carrier of a mutation. What does that mean? So remember again that you got one chromosome from your mother and you have one chromosome from your father, okay? And that is a carrier. Everybody has certain genes. You have to have these BRCA genes. A carrier means you have a mutation in a particular gene. That's a carrier. Now, the issue here is how does it move through your family? So we call it autosomal dominant, but what it means to you is 50% chance that you will pass along the chromosome that has the mutation to the next generation. Okay, so if you follow along, this is what you're going to see. And this, I like this slide because it actually tells you a lot. First of all, it tells you how things pass through the generations. It also means that even over a lifetime is only an 80% chance. So there will be some people in the family who may never get the problem, but still are capable of passing it on. And it's again, whether you're a woman or a man, you can pass it on to either child, male or female. And the other thing is that it's 50% with, um, with each pregnancy. But in fact, we all know it's 50-50 chance of having a boy or a girl. So how many of us, even in the room, have only sons or only daughters or we're one of six sisters? That can happen statistically. In a big group, it will always balance out. But family to family, you may not see it. So for example, here, I set it up such that this um, husband and wife sent along to each child the mutation. That's possible. It can happen the other way as well, that you never pass it along, 50-50 chance. And again, if you're not carrying the mutation, you can't pass it on to your kids either. So you actually can cause a break between generations, and I'll get to that later. Very, very important concept. Okay, so everybody hopefully is still, still with me here. So that's what we mean when we say a carrier. This person that I've got here, this person is a carrier. And they're a carrier of what? So these are the BRCA genes. The, the breast cancer genes, which now also we know affect ovarian function as well. It's two genes, BRCA1, BRCA2. They're on different chromosomes. This slide, though, is remarkable. So what is remarkable about this slide? If you're not Jewish, you also can have mutations in these genes, um, 
but they happen far less frequently than in the Jewish community. And the other thing that's actually quite astounding is that in the Jewish community, it's only three specific mutations. Why does this matter? Because if I see somebody in the office who's not of Jewish background, particularly Ashkenazi Jewish background, they have to go for a full sequencing. All those letters you saw, we have to do the full sequence. You might have read about some of this issue in the news about the actual testing. It is very expensive. In our world, we, over 90% are caused by only three changes. Much cheaper, much easier to do. Uh, we still, if those are negative and we really are concerned, you can go ahead and sequence the entire gene and there's more genes beside these now associated with breast cancer. But these genes in particular, in our community, it's only three. And that should ring a bell to what I mentioned much earlier. This is the same issue called the founder effect that we see in Tay-Sachs and some of these other disorders. Uh, what it means is that there was a time that, in, that everybody had a particular mutation. For uh, certain reasons, a Jewish community became isolated and smaller and carried that particular mutation. So instead of maybe, you know, one in a hundred, uh, in this case, maybe one in 10, one in 20 of a smaller group have exactly the same mutation. And our community, uh, really through time, did um, have certain halakhic cultural norms that we didn't marry out. We still married within the group, and then there was a large population explosion as well. So that's called the founder effect, and it really is very, uh, it, it's, it definitely matters to what we're talking about today. You see it in other communities as well. That's why in Tay-Sachs, French Canadians have a founder mutation. It's not the same as ours, but the concept is the same. A certain group from France left on a boat. One of those people happened to have a mutation. They come to the new world, and now that mutation is uh, more specific to that particular community. The really great thing about it, again, is because we've been able to study it well in the Jewish community, and we haven't had to spend thousands and thousands of dollars every time we wanted to do a particular test. So let's go to the next step. And this is where, you know, I'm going to segue a little bit into what we can do about this. But I just want to kind of catch up and kind of review where we're at before we go forward with the talk. So first of all, BRCA mutations cause a significantly increased risk for breast and ovarian cancer. And there are other cancers as well, but those are the big two. Okay, so important point, we got that down. Now, BRCA mutations are more common in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, and we're talking about one in 40. That's, again, not just women. It can be women or men. One in 40, if you're of especially Ashkenazi Jewish background, you could be carrying one of these mutations. This is going to matter a lot, because when you see numbers like that, this is no longer a family issue. This is a community issue. We're not going to lock out you know, one in 40 people from the community, from getting married, from participating in Jewish life in every way. And again, that's why today's session is so important. We need to take this on now as a family and community obligation. And again, you know, when tragedy strikes in our communities, if we lose somebody, especially a young mom, everybody shows up for that, right? Everybody is there to support that family. What we're going to talk about today is trying to make sure that doesn't happen as a community. And the next point is BRCA mutations can be passed down in families, right? So I think just want to take a look around the room, but everybody sees now how that could happen. Men can carry BRCA mutations, very important. So fathers can pass it along. And I can't overstress this point, even a lot of physicians have a bit of a problem with this because breast and ovarian, you just think of women. But you can see very clearly that it just gets passed along and it can get passed through dads as well. And this is the last bullet. Knowledge of BRCA mutation status can save lives. Okay, so now we're gonna segue into what we can do about it. And again, not be afraid of or depressed about all the information I just gave you but rather say, wow, we know all this, so what can we do to take this information and actually you know, prevent, uh, really prevent 
just catastrophe. I can't say it any uh, more strongly than that. So how can we save lives? There's three ways now that we have, and I'm going to speak first before I get into the next generation. We're going to, just going to speak now about women in your community, women you may see, women who may have an important family history, um, or even our own personal family histories that we can pick up on. So first of all, if you know, there are programs to monitor more closely than what we usually do in a standard way. Again, it's not your responsibility to know how often you need to get mammograms if you're part of the regular routine population versus what we do if you have a BRCA mutation. Not what you need to do. And I don't, you guys have so much to do and so much to remember. I don't want you to clutter your inbox with that information. Again, you can go on our website. There's a lot more to read about it. But we actually do monitor women differently. We use different machines, different techniques. The, especially in areas that have cancer centers are all over this um, as to how we follow people who have those mutations. So right away we can have fantastic impact. They should not be in a regular, you know, every year, every other year mammogram program. Okay, so you've already maybe saved a life just making sure somebody gets into the right monitoring program. Chemo prevention is a fancy way of saying drugs. Um, people may have heard of a drug called tamoxifen. We actually have drugs that uh, for certain um, types of mutations uh, can help be preventative. It can actually keep breast cancer from appearing. It does not work perfectly. It does not work necessarily in all women. And again, that is a issue for our top medical oncologists to determine which is the best drug for the best person. But here is another way to help women. So again, when you interact with women, if you think that this is an issue that may be going on, by getting this person to the right place, there is even medication that can help keep somebody healthy and well. Okay, so again, really huge, huge impact. Finally, prophylactic surgery. This one is the most interesting historically uh, because it does appear to work better than monitoring or you know any sort of drugs. And that is actually removal of the tissue that's at risk. So these are the, uh, that's the mastectomy and the oophorectomy. And uh, again, usually the oophorectomy, which is removal of ovaries, usually that waits until people have finished having their kids. Uh, for some women, they want to know because they may have their kids sooner and faster. It absolutely is preventative. The mastectomy, again, now that you know the biology, it makes sense. If you're worried that it's the breast tissue where these mutations play out, having less breast tissue around is going to make a big difference, right? So the other thing that's really remarkable is that the plastic surgery aspects, and again, these are things that women would talk to women about. The plastic surgery is remarkable. I can't, that I really cannot overstate. The difference um, over decades that we've seen in terms of reconstruction is remarkable. Having said that, this is no easy thing. It's a decision that women make. It is a decision that no woman ever wants to have to make. But again, you know, think about it. If you know about it, you understand it. Some women may be seeking guidance from you to talk about it. Uh, and it's also, it's very interesting. Again, I don't know if you saw the article in the New York Times about this, about what's going on in Israel. And I think it is, um, it is mentioned in there. Uh, women and men may look at that very, very differently. And what, has, what drives a lot of women in the community, and again, I, please, I do not want to speak for women individually because so much goes into this decision. Uh, but a lot of the driver, especially when I see young women with children, they want to be at their kids' bar and bat mitzvahs. They want to be at their kids' weddings. Um, the, you know, the passion for health and just to be with our families is such a huge driver. Um, I don't want to say this is not a driver for men as well, but again, I'm speaking, you know, as a woman, woman for women, when you do discuss uh, this, you'll get a sense right away that our issues, and it's actually well known, 
women are not very good at taking care of their own health. We're actually horrible at it, uh, often because we're the primary uh, person responsible for the health care of our families and the concern for our families. And again, that's been my experience. So again, when you're ever discussing this, a very, very important uh, driver in terms of how women do make their decisions. So, I just showed you that we can have incredible impact uh, on the problem. And again, if you're doing monitoring, the truth is you're monitoring to check for early, um, you know, early onset cancers. That's the truth with even mammography, right? You're actually looking for something. But the drugs I mentioned and the surgeries are really preventative so that if you know about this, you won't hopefully get cancer. But I have somebody in the office and they say, okay, well, you've taken care of me, but what you're telling me and what I'm understanding is I can still pass along a mutation, right? This can still be an issue into the next uh, generation. So I'm okay, but you know, I have kids to worry about. Or I have kids I want to marry off. And this becomes the shidduch issue. You know, when I get calls um, about shidduch concerns, nobody's actually concerned so much for themselves. It's always thinking about, okay, what does this mean? You know, now in my hearing that this is going to get passed along, uh, you know, what does it mean for me and my family? And that's really, that's really the concern. And so, again, a lot of thought has been going into this as well. The number one issue about the Shidduch, um, we call it sometimes the, the, the Shidduch crisis, uh, but this does come up a lot, and I want to be very clear. I've dealt with, again, really distinguished uh, rabbeim about this, and it is one of those moments that I've, again, seen not just incredible halachic knowledge, but tremendous compassion, uh, tremendous compassion, and again, you can't have a 1 in 40 problem that you're going to isolate and cut out of the community. It makes no sense. The second issue has to do with the fact that we're seeing it more and more, and again, in younger people. So people know that certain cancers are in the family. But what I also tell people is we all know now we see all sorts of things in the family, things as serious if not more so. Heart disease, right? Heart disease, stroke. There are other things that are so common. So hopefully, by getting the word out, this will start to be treated more as one of those other issues that we see all the time. So let's talk about the next generation. Is there something we can do? And what are the issues that are being spoken about now? And again, this has come out in recent articles as well. Now, my world is prenatal diagnosis. This is what I do. I've done for a living uh, really most of my life. And that is being able to tell the genetic makeup of fetuses um, before they're born. We do this for several reasons. It was actually very important to the whole Tay-Sachs issue. That was one of the other reasons there happened to be a big breakthrough at a certain time in um, history. It had a lot to do with prenatal diagnosis. So what I do for a living is I get fluid from around the amniotic fluid from around the baby, I actually don't have an interest in the fluid. There are cells that are floating around that the fetus gives off. They come from different places. It's not just the skin. Um, babies are drinking and swallowing all the time. So um, that's really, the cells are internal, probably some external cells. Every cell, if you remember when we spoke about the basic genetics, has the entire code, every single cell. So we take out the cells, we actually get rid of the fluid, we take the cells, take out the DNA, and we can read anything we want from the DNA. We do it through amniocentesis later in the pregnancy, or we can do it through what's called chorionic villus sampling, where earlier we can take a piece of placenta. Um, it works as well, by the way, because when we first started and we were just a few days old, half of us, half of our cells became us, half of our cells became our placenta. So because it came from a really a single um, cell, they not perfectly but very carefully mirror each other. So that's why you can take a piece of placenta and it'll reflect what's going on there as well. Now, of course, the whole idea of prenatal diagnosis becomes very complicated. There are halachic issues doing this. Uh, this is nothing that's done lightly. And again, very often in our community, this is done in full collaboration with a Rav. Um, 
very, very frequently. But there's a new technology that, again, some of you in the room may be familiar with, and that was the whole world of in vitro fertilization. It's actually been around for decades. But this idea that you could actually put uh, eggs and sperm together in a dish, start the embryo going, and then reimplant back into the womb, you can imagine broke the field open in every which way. The big news, however, for my world was what was called uh, pre-implantation genetics, that we finally had the technology that we could actually read a single cell. That's the picture on the bottom, but what I really want to share with you is this. This is um, the care, just the credit is up there, but this is from Montefiore's Institute of Reproductive Medicine, and I'm going to show you a video clip in a minute, but what I'm hoping you can see is that here is a pipette that holds the embryo in place, um, and it's really a remarkable thing. This is just really the very first few hours of life. See all those cells in there? Okay, those, that's what we all looked like very, very early on. It's just really a miracle to look at that, and then please look around the table and look how you get from that to what you see. It's just an incredible thing. These are all, not completely, but more or less all clones. They all have they all have the same DNA code. Again, um, what we're finding from biology is it's not always exactly the case. There actually may be some minor differences, but by and large, um, one cell is reflective of all of the cells. And this, is, this has a lot to do with actually the cloning that you hear about. And there it is, right? There, there they are. Those cells are going to keep dividing more and more, and they will become us. That's, that's what it all looks like. Now, can you see over here, there's like another little pipette? And you're going to see it in a minute. But this is how pre-implantation genetic happens, uh, genetic diagnosis happens. We need to get out a cell. So let's, let's go ahead and do this. Okay, can you see the pipette come in on the side there? Watch, watch what's going to happen. A cell, we're going to focus in on a cell. Can you see it? Okay, watch. Gone. Okay, that cell now is going to go to a lab. It's going to be red. And it is, just imagine, right, being alive in a time like now, to be able to see something like that, and we can read it. It's happening all over the world, every single day. Israel actually has one of the best centers in the world, um, is in Israel doing this right now. Israel is a very busy IVF center um, for numerous reasons. First of all, it really is a Jewish ethic to have children. That, that's part of us. Um, and it's certainly playing out in Israel as well. Um, from a halakhic point of view, I have to be very careful today because I, I really can't speak to that um, the way uh, experienced expert uh, Rav can. Having said that, uh, there actually this type of diagnosis and in vitro fertilization gets over some of the halakhic hurdles that we have had to face in the past when I spoke to you about the amniocentesis and the chorionic villus sampling, which might be a, actually a bigger issue. The idea here is we take that cell now to the lab, we figure out the DNA code, and only put in the embryos, we've now biopsied an embryo, right? Only put back in the embryos that don't have any issue. So that's what pre-implantation genetics is capable of doing. It is very interesting, absolutely places in the world now are doing this for the BRCA. And Remember what I showed you before? Tay-Sachs gene will never be gone in our community, ever. The effect of children may be, but the gene can't be. Because we're never, because if you're a carrier with Tay-Sachs, you're 100% healthy. We have no interest that not having carriers in the community. But if you think about what I've been talking to you about today, remember when I showed you how you could pass this down generation to generation? If you only implant embryos without the mutation, then the BRCA is gone. So this is, um, this is one way that the Jewish community has been dealing and individuals have been dealing with the issue. Again, I really have to put in a disclaimer that this is high-end halacha. Um, and I hope Rabbi Willie won't mind if I quote him, you know, but he has said that you know, there's high risk uh, maternal fetal medicine, right? It's high risk obstetrics. There's what's called high risk halacha as well. So it's very, very important that when you're dealing with a rav, uh, this is a specialty item. 
but it's very important for you to be aware of this because you may hear about it and now you know as much as really most of the medical community does about this. So how can you use this information? And this is how I want to wrap up. So how are we all going to go out basically as an army to save lives? These are the things you need to be thinking about. And again, they're in the handouts that you have, but anyone in the community who meets the following criteria really needs to see a genetic counselor. And this is where I need you to have your eyes and ears really wide open. Anybody who is of Jewish background, especially Ashkenazi Jewish background, who has had breast cancer, anybody who has had ovarian cancer, diagnosis of male breast cancer, it is rare, so when it happens, if you hear about it, get them to um, expert counseling, um, very important. Has a family member been diagnosed with breast cancer? And I realize you should be thinking at this point, this is a whole lot of people that I need to be talking to or thinking about, okay? So just think about how many lives you saved. And remember, for each person you identify, you now are potentially helping an entire family. Have a family member diagnosed with ovarian cancer, okay? That family member, um, they've been diagnosed with ovarian cancer, but maybe you're talking to uh, the child, right? You're talking to the daughter, niece, relative, you know, there's a relative there, they should be thinking about genetic counseling. And again, family member with male breast cancer. If, if we, again, as an army, just get out there and start looking and spreading the word about this, we'll have done something incredible. And again, the job is not for you to do the counseling. The job is not for you to tell them what their risks are. The job is not for you to tell them, oh, well, you know, we have this now, we can do this now and that now. The genetic counselors will take care of it. A lot of the information I gave you today is to help talk people through this and be there for them as well. And um, I will get to that in a moment, but also just keep your ears open for other cancers. And these will sound common to you. The male breast cancer is very unusual. So when you hear that, everybody usually stops, right? Like you don't need me to tell you male breast cancer. Um, pancreatic cancer. Prostate cancer, and a little less so melanoma, but um, prostate, pancreatic cancer, we've seen those as well, right? Those are pretty common, and you see them in men as well. So when you start hearing in the family that, you know, somebody had an uncle with um, prostate and their sister had breast, right? Now you're going to start thinking about it. Now it's going to start coming to you that maybe this is a pattern. Again, not your job to put the pattern together. They're really people who are experts in this. And when a genetic counselor uh, speaks to somebody, this is not a five minute session. Uh, prenatal, we kind of zip through a little faster. Cancer genetics, really, they spend a lot of time, a lot of time. So why are Revitsons so vital? I realize I'm not just speaking to Revitsons. I'm using Revitsons now globally as those women in our community who are closest to other women in our community. Why are you so vital? So again, you are very often the first to know. And if you have this information now, even subtle clues may ring a bell uh, when you hear them. And what are some of the issues? And again, these are women's issues. Anxiety. Sometimes people don't even want to talk about these things. If you know about them ahead of time, you can actually talk to them. You can just put out an open-ended question. You know, for example, a lot of women going through what you're going through are often anxious, you know, that this may come back, or there might be else something there. That's a really great way often to just start that conversation going. The surgeries, the loss of femininity, they're gonna to talk to women about that. Okay, that's what they're gonna to talk to. They're gonna to talk to you. Experiencing feelings of guilt about passing on a mutation to her children, I cannot even begin to tell you how powerful that is. Again, you know, people at the table, there may be people listening on who aren't mothers. Um, if you are, you will understand this bullet. I need not say any more. You know exactly what that means. Worried about stigmatization in her community, our community, this issue of being marriageable, what can I do if people see me go to the oncologist, they're going to know something is going on. 
So again, sensitivity to that, I cannot even, I, I, that I really can't say again and again. And there's help, whether it's through our organization, but certainly at that point, you know, speaking to Rob about it as well, to reassure them this is really not an issue when it comes to health. Thinking about disclosure to family and how it may affect them. So again, there is the shit up issue. Um, when should young people be tested? Uh, comes up a lot, family planning issues we touched on. Those are all things that you can have incredibly powerful impact. And again, we all have girlfriends that we talk to about everything, right? We all know that, that's what we do. But when you're speaking to them as a leader in our community, imagine the message that sends, okay? You're not alone. This is not a personal issue anymore. This is something that affects us as a Jewish people. So. I am going to help you with this, and I'm wearing that role as well, not just as a friend or mentor. Again, I'm kind of preaching to the, to the choir on this one. Uh, you self-selected. You decided to take on the roles you're taking on because you actually like being around people, and you like listening. You have to be good listeners in the roles you're doing. So, you know, it says listen and listen again. You are already people who do that and do that well. Offer your own support, but know when to refer. That's really what the talk about was today, to identify those that you're going to send on for expert care. Except that now you'll be able to help hold their hand through the process as well. And initiate a discussion about disclosure to other family members. I'm not sure that is, um, but this is very important. You're, and again, it's interesting, there's an overlap actually with physicians when it comes to this and people who are in the clergy or um, again, people who deal in the religious class, we'll call it for today. What you can tell and what you can't tell. If somebody is actually a mutation carrier, you've now identified a problem in the family. Uh, but we act, we, actually can't just call up, you know, Aunt Fanny and say, you know, I gotta tell you, you've got this mutation in the family, you may be at risk. That physicians actually cannot do that. There are rare times that we actually are allowed to disclose. They are very, very rare, and this doesn't meet the benchmark to do that. Uh, the usual, again, I don't want to speak out of turn as a lawyer, uh, you're usually allowed to break confidence if there's immediate harm somebody actually is going to die and you have information and you need to s supply that information for somebody to protect themselves. That's when the legal issues um, kick in. But having said that, even if it's an 80% risk, it's not 100% risk, it, is just, it does not meet that level of requiring disclosure. So the way we do it and the way you will do it is just to get the conversation going, explain to them that other family members may be at risk and there's all sorts of family dynamics going on. You know, we've seen families come closer together, we've seen families blow apart. So that's where you become extraordinarily vital uh, to helping figure out what the family dynamic is, you know, what's going on, and if you can be of help to the family. And think proactively. Again, you know, there is our Jewish genetic health program, we network with genetic counselors all over. In the New York area, again, I know we're online, in the New York area, of course, there are, are cancer centers here and throughout a lot of the major metropolitan areas, but don't let that hold you back. We can help find the right place for the right person. They can be in the middle of, uh, really, New Mexico. We will get help. We'll work with you to get help. Because again, you know, we're spread out all over the place. Uh, we don't all live in New York. I actually know there are people I'm hearing that maybe aren't from Canada. I'm actually from, I was born in Hamilton and spend a lot of my time growing up and all my education just about in Toronto. So uh, a, a shout out to my uh, non-American uh, landsman out there. And with that, again, there are more resources. They're in the handouts. But I just really want to thank uh, you very, very much. I hope you can hear, even in my voice, there's a limit of what I can do, and there's a limit to what the program for Jewish genetic health can do. The number of people that you can touch dwarfs in many ways 
what we can accomplish because that's only once you get to us can we help you so, and help uh, an individual and their family. So again, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I really appreciate the time. I know how busy you all are. And I think we probably have time for a few questions, I think. So thank you. Are there any questions here in the room? Okay, and can you go to a microphone, please? No, no, but people no, need people to hear you. Hear you. He, he need to hear you. No, please take the mic. Hi, have the survival rates for ovarian cancer increased over the years? Um, I you don't. The yes, has the survival rates of ovarian cancer increased over the years? Um, I am not an oncologist, so I don't want to give you a yes or no on that. Um, definitely, the the treatments, the approaches. Um, have been changing our understanding. You know, it depends what you mean over the years because it really was, you know, a dreadful thing not that very long ago. A lot of the issue is trying to pick it up earlier. That's the problem. What I said at the outset is very true. Uh, we pick it up late and we've been disappointed because a lot of the screening that we wanted to have for ovarian uh, <coughs> just does not seem to, that we, a lot of the screening that we have for breast um, doesn't seem to work, the concept of early detection. Uh, there is so much research going on right now. Um, the technology, a lot of it also is just the technology breakthrough. So there's also already tests trying to read um, cancer cells in your bloodstream. Um, that's coming out now. So with the technology, as it gets better, I want to tell you I have to believe it's going to get better. Okay, is the CA125 test still the only test for ovarian cancer? There are others. Um, ultrasound has gotten a lot of play as well, and there are other markers as well. Uh, but generally, when we talk about it, the, the bottom line is that we wish we had a screening system so that, myself included, everybody that walks out of the room could have a simple blood test, we pick it up early and get the problem taken care of. So it's, it's much more manageable and treatable and curable early. Um, so I, I have to tell you, I know of fantastic women and men doing research all over the world trying to get to the bottom of this. The corollary is what we're talking about today. If at least this we can prevent, and that was what I was speaking about in terms of monitoring. If you know that people are at higher risk, they may be in, in different programs. And that's why it's key. I, again, I just cannot overemphasize we have to prevent because anybody, there, there really shouldn't be a person in the room who's not been touched by ovarian or breast cancer, even their own family or a loved one. It's not possible. And the only you know, way for us to approach it is we're going to, we're going to win. Like I have no doubt in my mind we're going to win. Um, and that's what I need your help for today. Okay, it's a little complicated about various firm. So we keep on getting phone calls about all our kids who are in Shidduchim, um, what to do about various Sharon. Some people who know that they have already some kind of a genetic issue, they said it costs $100 every single time they have to contact Darius Sharon. I'm not against Darius Sharon. I'm just saying what people are frustrated about. They have to pay $100 if they want Daria Sharon to do that genetic test for both them and the person that they're going to go out with, a lot of people just don't bother. Daria Sharon cannot disclose what the, if somebody is a genetic carrier. It can only tell you if you match to the number that you give in. And a tremendous amount of parents and kids in Shadokam are calling us and asking what to do. And I keep saying maybe you should just go on your own to a genetic counselor. But then, for Shaduchim, they're not going to tell anybody, and they're going to stick to the Dar Yisharim plan. It's a huge plan. I think thousands of kids are in Dar Yisharim. My daughter's in Israel. And Dar Yisharim comes. They take tests from high schools and from seminaries and from all the boys' yeshivas. So, so any ideas? Yes, so I'll speak to that. First of all, um, that's not the, the, the RCA, the breast cancer discussion. But um, I will say that um, our program is jointly sponsored by Einstein and Yeshiva University. Uh, OU, RCA, 
in Yeshiva University, um, you know, young Israel, that's our world. And I uh, won't speak to, to Doria Sharim, but we do that screening. We were actually on, on campus, we've been on YU campus, and they're using our approach to screening, um, which is the Torah Umada approach, which is to protect yourself, you need to know. It, you know, information for us is always positive. Again, this is not, B BRCA, it's the same idea. You're talking about the screening for Tay-Sachs and the other disorders. Number one, knowledge, that's what we are about. That's number one. Number two, with everything changing very quickly, that's what you're describing. We have new, um, we have new tests for disorders coming online, it seems like every few months. So if you go through a program where you know what's going on, it's no big deal. The, that's the issue. If you don't know, you can't keep updating. And finally, it's exactly the same problem. The stigma goes away when we acknowledge that this is a community issue. If we cover it up or we say, oh, we don't want to know, that psychologically, what does that do to a young person, right? I may have a mutation that's really, you know, dangerous or bad. As opposed to, you know, we go on campus, we go to YU, the students are fantastic, they're helping organize the program. It completely changes the dynamic. It's now not that we should be depressed, afraid, put our heads in the sand, but again, it comes back to the same thing. You know, we're the people of the book, right? We're the people who have gotten to where we've gotten because we learn all the time. And we value knowledge. And the only way to beat what I'm talking about today, the same way we did for Tay-Sachs, is you gotta know. Okay, this is the best way to fight the problem. So thank you for bringing it up, even though it wasn't relevant. You know, it's not the RCA, but I appreciate the question. Thank you so much for coming. I myself am a carrier, so this is incredibly informative, and I'm really glad that this is getting out with the OU, so thank you so much. Um, with that being said, are there kits, sort of a sheer in a bag, where if you wanted to do a general, um, program in which you could go ahead and maybe have a couple slides to start and kick off the conversation. Is that available um, or is that something that can be created that might help open up the door for the conversation if there's something that already has support materials um, to go ahead and be able to talk about in communities? Okay, so I'm just smiling from ear to ear. So first of all, you know, just for you to be able to say what you just said, um, there may be I'm not kidding, there may be somebody who will be at their son's bar mitzvah next year because of what you just did. Just fl plain and simple. I'm going to try not to tear up. Um, yeah. And um, in terms of, ed of education, that's exactly what our program is doing. That's I I'm just, you know what, let me, I'm going to come all the way back so people can see it up, post it up there um, while we talk. We launched a program. Um, and there is a short public service announcement. There's actually an educational program about it. But having said that, one of the things I think is the most important, the way to get success, is that you target, um, we call it cultural sensitivity, you know, when we're talking about other um, communities. I really think what we need is input from you. That's why, honestly, having met Judy and the amazing people at OU, I, I can't tell you what it felt like to sit at a table to work in partnership, right? Wouldn't you say, Judy? That's exactly what happened. So what I would like from this session is, because Judy's not busy enough, okay, this is what we're exactly what we're going to work on, because we definitely have a lot of great educational programs. You can go on the website. You are welcome to use it in any way. We provided handouts, but that's not the same, like perhaps working together, working on packaging this so it makes sense for your communities, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's uh, some of some of what we do is generic. Some is more targeted. We've gotten wonderful support, for example, from Jewish Federation, um, and it's a beautiful moment, I think, actually, for YU and Einstein to be seen as leadership, not just for the Orthodox community. When it comes to genetics, it really levels the playing floor. The mutations don't seem to care, you know, whether or not you know you you know how long your kiddush is. A shot this morning after Shoal. I can promise you it doesn't seem to make a distinction there. So, um, Judy? Okay, I, there are three questions that have been uh, sure. uh, in contact with you. First is when you said late age to have birth, to have children, what exactly do you mean by that is the first question. Um, I am not going to give you like a cutoff age. I'll just say 
that it seems to be related to estrogen exposure and the more you um, have cycles. That's why the birth control pill works. It shuts down your ovarian function, like you don't keep cycling. When you're pregnant, likewise, you don't keep cycling. And those issues um, are related to cancers because breast and ovarian are hormonal. Um, if you have your kids early, you have lots of kids, you're breastfeeding, uh, it may cut down your risk a little bit. So that's a better way to think of it. Um, there's a lot of issues with delayed childbearing, you know, beyond this one, um, as you know. But again, it kind of, the, the corollary is if you do know that this is an issue, some people actually do tailor their families um, a little bit more towards that. Okay, so the other two questions, thank you. The other two questions are, have this given both, and you can just answer them. Should, should men also be tested for carry? And if so, you know, uh, and just so, that, so that they're knowledgeable. And also, is genetic testing covered by, by any medical insurance? Excellent. So definitely when it comes to men, I hope that was a big take home point because we focus so much on breast and ovarian, prostate and pancreas is completely kind of falls out and it shouldn't. And you know, now you all know why it gets passed on through um, fathers. And sometimes the pickup was late because of that. So the answer is absolutely yes. Again, the entry point I believe will often be through women because the breast and ovarian, that's just what is more common. But when the counselor will speak to the family, they'll spend a long time, they draw out a huge family tree, um, several generations worth, and then the genetic counselor can direct traffic as who should be tested. It's not always a simple thing. Sometimes it actually makes more sense to test the, the men in the family than actually the women in the family. Uh, not always, but uh, with, if you have an expert uh, team, they can actually figure out who should be tested and how. And there was one more question, which is the insurance. Right. Very important. Um, over time, if you have family history in particular, uh, the insurances have come on board. Actually, very much because of what I just discussed with you today, there's what, there are things you can do to prevent more serious problems. So the insurance companies can use that as a calculation First of all, they do maintain that they really do care about keeping people healthy. Having said that, um, uh, let's move on from there. Even on an economical calculation, you can understand that where it's not the bad old days when there was nothing to do. You had a mutation and it was a disaster. Um, you can now look at it differently, and even they can figure out the math that keeping people healthy is always going to be cheaper than having people who need cancer treatments. Um, and also, even if you know, you do have uh, breast cancer, you manage it differently if you have mutation. So that being the case, again, it makes more sense for the insurance companies to have this managed properly. It's not always the case. It depends on the insurance. We all know the story where somebody thought, you know, they bought Cadillac insurance and turned out to be a Ford. We've all been there. We've all been, um, and, and in fact, I don't know if anybody recalls this, um, and we were in the time of Obamacare, but actually I think President Obama lost his mother to ovarian cancer and his memory of his mother is on her deathbed speaking to the insurance companies. So that's not what, you know, what we should be about. Um, and the other thing is, again, there are very generous people in our communities that have helped, that help out a lot. You all know that to be the case. We help out emotionally, but actually a lot of the work you do sometimes is trying to get people taken care of financially. Uh, so um, that's number one. And then loss of insurance. One of the things with the new insurance program is not to lose your insurance if you're sick. So we'll see how that plays out, but that's a big, huge change in this country. Again, for the, my, Canadian, uh, my Canadian sisters out there who are listening, it's a different system out there. Everybody's always covered. Um, you don't have the same issues of fear of loss of insurance. Um, a genetic counselor will walk you through all those concerns as well. Any other questions? So I want to, I, we want to thank Dr. Gross so much for taking the opportunity to speak to us. I think we all know now what our charge is. Uh, those of us who are Rebbitsons, college teachers, you so, or just regular people in the community. We all have friends, neighbors, and this is what we can talk about in, uh, when we have Shabbos afternoon gatherings. This is, this is a message we can give out to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
Now, typically it's common in older populations. The reason is what I just explained. Over the course of a lifetime, statistically, more and more changes can happen in the DNA. That's why it's a function of older people. Um, that, that number is true, one in two men to one in three women. Again, there are um, cancers such as skin cancer is very common, very easily treatable, uh, that will come just over time and certain exposures, uh, but that number is actually real. The number that scares all of us, the one in eight risk of breast cancer, but that number is over the course of a lifetime. If you make it out to be 80 years old, you do have a more than 10% chance that that may happen. Ovarian cancer is really much rarer. Even if you live a very long, full life, it's unusual to have uh, ovarian cancer. It's not as common as breast cancer. As a doctor and as a woman, it's a little scarier because we don't have very good screening tests for it. And that's why if any of you do know uh, a woman who's had ovarian cancer, breast cancer we tend to pick up earlier. You can feel um, lumps, you go for mammograms, Ovarian cancer, we don't have programs like that. So often by the time it's picked up, it's a little later. Uh, so it's less rare, but unfortunately more concerning. And the last bullet, most cancers are not hereditary. You can't pass on cancers by and large. What I describe is the usual case. Over the course of time, you build up these changes and that's the common cancer. What I'm gonna to speak to you today, however, is this idea of hereditary cancers, of being able to pass along. So that's about it for my introduction. And now let's get into um, to the program. Again, for those of you who can get on the web, we have posted educational programs. We even have one about breast and ovarian that might answer a lot of the questions you still have today. Uh, you know, there's a lot of medical detail and, and uh, you know, other such Finer points, not my highlight of the program today. Today it's really to empower you to really save lives. So again, very quick slide about cancer. Uh, the way to understand cancer is we do call it a genetic disease and you hear it a lot, so I just want to explain it so we don't get confused. Uh, cells are dividing all the time. Cells make mistakes and 99 plus percent of the time, really the miracle of human body and biology is we correct the mistakes as our cells divide. From time to time, that correction does not occur. And if you have a buildup of certain changes in the DNA, then you end up with cells that don't know to stop growing and don't know where they should be. So that's why, for example, if you have certain cancers, they spread. Cells should know, for example, breast cells. They belong in the breast. But when some of these changes happen, they spread where they shouldn't be. Likewise, cells in our bodies know, need to know when to stop growing. Same problem. These changes make certain effects that the cells just don't stop. And that, in fact, is what cancer is. Jewish children. And again, to tell you what it means to be here today, breast cancer is not new. It's been around for a very long time. A lot of our knowledge is new, and I'll be presenting that to you today. But what has changed, and this is really the take home message, this is not a talk on the genetics of breast cancer. It really isn't. I'm gonna to explain to you all of it. You'll know as much, I promise you, as my medical students and genetic counselors and my fellows by the time we're done. It's really, I love genetics. The beauty in it is its, its simplicity, but I'm here today because there is so much that we can do to prevent breast cancer, aside from manage, but to actually prevent. And we have, again, it's about generations. We have, please God, for, you know, certainly the rest of my lifetime, but even after we are not here anymore, we're going to have generations and generations of Jewish children we do need to care about. And that's why I'm here. That's our responsibility today. Um, I'm also really here on behalf of the program for Jewish genetic health, so I'm not even speaking personally. Um, I was the founding director of this program. It's now been taken over by fantastic staff, um, really from top to bottom in terms of medical leadership and the best genetic counselors I've ever had the privilege of working with. Um, in your folders, the people who are actually in the room, um, there is the contact information. It is a joint program with Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Yeshiva University. Um, the phone number for those uh, who are online, 718-430-4156. And the email is health at yu.edu. The web is www.yu.edu slash genetichealth. 
Even I still just Google this, put in Einstein program Jewish genetic health, it'll come up. And again, please note, um, that name was not an accident. It is not Jewish genetic disease. It is Jewish genetic health. The program deals with everything that may interact with being Jewish and genetic. Um, I have had the privilege of working with Rabbi Willig and, and other several, um, really Gdole Hador on questions that come up. Uh, but very often, uh, the people I'm speaking to today, the women I'm speaking to today, first know about these issues. Rebetzins, Yatsa Halacha, all of the people in color classes, all of what you do, I can't even begin to tell you how important it is. I'm speaking to you today as a Jewish woman about Jewish women for Jewish women. And again, there are actually men in the room who are helping us organize the program today. There may be men listening in, but I think all of you can understand that there's a certain sensitivity that really only comes about when, again, coming full circle, we look at this as a sisterhood. And that's going to be... Uh... Thank you again for joining us. We are sure that this will be a very informative program. It is my honor to call upon Dr. Gross. So, of course, I have to say uh, two things. First, uh, very recent development in my career. I'm also now the chief medical officer at a company called Natera. So I just want to just uh, let people know they do, in fact, do genetic testing, although not breast and ovarian cancer. Um, but more importantly, just to say thank you, really from the bottom of my heart, for welcoming me here today. Uh, I think there is a historical context. We've done a lot of work on autosomal recessive disorders, commonly known as Jewish genetic diseases, Tay-Sachs, familial dysautonomia, uh, Gaucher, and the like. And there are similarities and differences, but the major similarity is that it should be noted, and it is important to say again and again, the reason that as a medical geneticist, I actually have not seen a child with Tay-Sachs is because 30 years ago when I was a teenager, the Jewish community decided that we have the knowledge, the power, the intelligence, and the compassion to take care of a problem within our community. It was the sisterhoods that partnered um, with the medical uh, leadership at the time to make sure that there would be no more children affected with these disorders. And that since that time, we're talking about thousands and thousands of healthy, 